So the title on the on the slide, which might be different, I'm sure it's different than what's in the program, uh, is is this global warming, and that's that's a general question that a lot of people are in the public and and in um, government and other decision makers are asking uh, about a lot of different events, uh, a lot of different extreme events, including the California drought that we're in now. So uh, I'm going to talk about the California drought. Um, for the most part, but I think the general uh, question of how do we sort of scientifically test hypotheses about unprecedented extreme events uh, is, is a much more general challenge and one that will you know, run through a lot of the threads of the, of the session today. So why are we interested in this? I think I, you know, I can probably skip this slide, but uh, depending on the crowd, sometimes it's worth, it's worth uh, reminding ourselves that... Um, Global warming is happening. It's an observation. Uh, it's, you know, it's not a matter of um, debate or belief. Um, I will note that we're, you know, we're we're sort of at about halfway to the to the UN target, at least the UN target from from the Copenhagen Accord. We'll see what happens in Paris. But I think the main point I want to make here is that one, we're already experiencing impacts from climate change from this one degree or so. Uh, Celsius of global warming has already happened, and two that even if there's you know this even if even if the the world manages to hold global warming to two degrees Celsius, that's still twice the global warming that we've already had. Right, so you know we're we're in a situation where certainly um, mitigation is important for managing climate risk, but we're guaranteed uh, to have more climate change. We're guaranteed to have more impacts from climate change. Uh, so we we uh, we mean. There's a, in terms of the adaptation discussions that are going on at, at this meeting, there's the imperative of um, both adapting to what we're already experiencing, but also uh, kind of leapfrogging towards towards further changes because those are baked into the system even from a policy perspective. Um, and that brings up the issue of risk management, and you know we're we're talking a lot about um, adaptation as part of this risk management uh, approach. Certainly, mitigation is part. As well, you know, the, the, what the, the risks of climate change that we face in the future are, are you know, going to be um, largely influenced by by this. Uh, uh, which is the pointer button? Um, by you know what's on the right of this IPCC diagram, the, the socioeconomic processes as they call it. But certainly, what we heard a lot about in the plenary today about equity and access to. Um, the energy resources that are needed for fundamental human well-being, and that that will uh, go a long way to determining how much climate change there is. Uh, so what I'll talk about uh, in this uh, presentation is the hazards petal in the IPCC flower of risk management. Um, so h what are we doing to think about the probability of, of these hazards? With Calvin Trout as one example and something we're, we're all aware of, um, this photo was taken in January uh, of 2015, somewhere somewhere around 8,000 feet or something like that, um, in Tioga Pass, where there was no snow at the time. Um, all right, so uh, you know a lot of people here at the, at the conference have, have done hard work to you know figure out what what the impacts of this drought are. Uh, I think it's um, you know, we. We, uh, we're, we're experiencing these in real time. Uh, the most recent analysis from, from UC Davis, uh, earlier this month, um, you know, had an update of the, you know, the, the jobs and, and economic losses from the event. From a climate perspective, you know, it's now really clear that, that this is an unprecedented event in, in our historical experience in terms of instrumental measurements of, of climate in California, uh, by many measures, uh, drought indicators, um, temperature, uh, precipitation in terms of 12-month uh, precipitation, calendar year uh, precipitation, uh, and, and the combination, as, as Peter has pointed out in the recent commentary, the combination of uh, warm and dry together um, also being unprecedented in the, in the historical record. So we know it's an extreme. We know it's an extreme from a statistical point of view. We know it's an extreme in terms of the impact that we're feeling. Um, and you know, the, the proximal cause in terms of the lack of water falling out of the sky is this uh, 
for, for much of the drought has been this ridiculously resilient ridge, and that's the name that um, that Daniel Swain, who's a graduate student in my group, uh, coined on his uh, California weather blog, uh, which is definitely the most, uh, the highest impact and most famous part of my research group, without a doubt, uh, is the, the California weather blog. He started in high school. I did not know that it existed until I was reading an article in The Economist, and there was a, a ridiculously resilient ridge. What the heck is that? And I clicked on the link, and there it went to Daniel's blog, and then I knew about his blog. Um, so I, I can't claim any credit for the ridiculously resilient ridge or blame. Um, so this, on, this is just the, the uh, cartoon from the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, and uh, in, in 2013, uh, this is just one example of the precipitation deficit that, that we've experienced associated with this ridge on the right. Uh, each of those gray lines is one year in the historical uh, precipitation record for, um, for California statewide, and it's cumulative, right, marching through the year uh, in each of those uh, gray lines. The red is calendar year 2013, uh, so this is the, this is this is the evidence for what I had on the previous slide about uh, the lowest calendar year precipitation happening during this drought. Uh, calendar year 2013 was uh, about a third of the mean precipitation and considerably lower for the full uh, calendar year precipitation than uh, calendar year 1976. And what happened during this um, during this calendar year was this, this uh, ridiculously resilient ridge was uh, particularly resilient. Uh, it was so resilient, it was ridiculous. Um, so this is, a, this is an animation from Daniel uh, showing um, the, the sort of monthly scale uh, geotensional heights uh, for mostly the fall of 2013, just as an example. And you can see this is this is a dynamic feature, uh, even even at the monthly scale. It, you know, it, it moves around. Uh, it's not um, it's not like a wall. Uh, as some reporters have described it, um, and what we what we published, and this is this is uh, the last that I'll say about this work on the ridge uh, for this presentation. But you know, what we find is that having really persistent ridging like this is uh, unprecedented in in our historical record of of the atmospheric circulation. It's uh, when we do the uncertainty analysis on the return period, it's a really rare occurrence in the current climate. Uh, anywhere from century scale to uh, two millennia. Right? So that's the 5% to 95% uh, range on the calculated return period. So it's a really rare event, uh, really, in the current climate. Uh, clearly bad luck um, to, to get this kind of persistent ridging. And when we um, try to try to quantify the probability of this uh, atmospheric configuration in the current climate relative to the climate without global warming, uh, it, 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 while it's rare in the current climate, it's less rare uh, than it's less rare than it would have been without any global warming at all. So, um, again, plenty of bad luck involved in the lack of precipitation, but, um, but some evidence that, that global warming has has made that bad luck more likely. Um, the other thing that's been happening, is, as Mike alluded to, uh, is that we've experienced really warm temperatures. So what I want to talk about for most of the the rest of the time here is the influence of temperature on on drought risk in in California. And this is uh, show results from paper that came out uh, earlier this year in uh, PNAS. Um, the San Francisco Chronicle also uh, produced some versions of of the figures, which their versions look look a lot nicer than the figures that I made for the paper. The problem is their versions don't have any units on them, so it's difficult to know. Difficult to know what's going on. Um, so uh, the bottom line, just from looking at, at the chronicle versions, is that uh, California has warmed. We heard that this morning. Um, it's a clear long-term trend. Uh, precipitation. There's there's really not uh, not any statistically significant change in precipitation over the course of the historical record for annual scale precipitation. Uh, but what we do see clearly is an increase in uh, severe drought episodes in the historical record. Uh, so this is a version from uh, the paper, which is much more busy, but does have units in this case, uh, standardized units. Uh, and and when, we, when we just go back and um, 
I mean, my research groups are, um, my grad students and postdocs are, they're, they're, they're working with some really, um, really, for me, really advanced statistical methods. What I do is I go through and I count every time something happens, and then I divide it by the total number of years, and I multiply it by 100, and I call it the percent. And this is something you guys might want to start using, cutting edge percent, if you haven't heard of it. Um, so if I just go through and count, count up years, uh, what, you know, what's there in the, in the historical record is that um, low precipitation years are necessary for drought in California. So if you look at the, if you look at the middle panel, that's the, the annual precipitation. The uh, red dots are the drought years. And there aren't any drought years that happen in California without low precipitation. We don't find any wet years that, that have a drought indicator in the, in the NCDC record. But, um, and that, I mean, you know, I'm agnostic. That didn't have to be the case, but it turned out to be that way. But low precipitation is not sufficient for drought. And in fact, we see a lot of years where there was low precipitation, and in the, in the NCDC database, there, there's not a drought year. Uh, and really, it's really the, inter, the interaction of, of high temperature with low precipitation that elevates the risk of drought. And, and over the course of the historical record in California, uh, there's about twice the probability of a low precipitation year producing drought if that low precipitation year is also warm. And um, you know, usually when I say this to you know, reporters or my grandma or somebody, um, the response I get is, well, obviously, drought years are warm, and low precipitation years are warm. And it's true that over the last two decades in California, low precipitation years have been warm. Um, but that's because most of the years have, have been warm. Uh, but if we look back uh, in the earlier in the record, that's not the case. Um, so we look at the full record, uh, about a quarter of the years, sorry, about, about half the years have been wet, about half the years have been dry. About half the years been warm and half the years been cool. And, uh, basically this is like flipping two coins. Um, and the, the precipitation coin came up tails about half the time, the temperature coin came up about half the time, and they came up tails together, uh, about a quarter of the time. Uh, but what's been happening, um, recently, I'm sorry, uh, just to, just to give you the, the drought number real quick, but when that, when that low precipitation co-occurs with with high temperature, there's, again, more than twice the probability that low precipitation year will produce drought. So 54, 54% of, of uh, low precipitation years that are also warm produce drought, whereas only 25% of low precipitation years that are cool produce drought. And what's been happening uh, with that uh, long-term warming in California that I showed you in the, just from the, from the instrumental record is that uh, over the last Two decades, 80% of the years have been warm. Uh, and what that means is we've got this temperature coin that's just coming up tails sort of over and over. And uh, it's, it's, uh, what it's doing is it's increasing the odds that when low precipitation happens, that it's happening within a warm context. And as a result, uh, we're getting more dry, uh, more trapped out here. So uh, over, um, if we compare the last 20 years with the previous century, what we see is that the fraction of years that are drought years has doubled. Uh, the fraction of low precipitation years that coincide with warm temperature has doubled, and the fraction of uh, low precipitation years that produce drought has also doubled. Uh, so we argue in paper this is a doubling of the risk of, um, of uh, drought years in California. You may have read uh, either the paper or a news article about the paper that came out last week from Columbia Park Williams at all. Uh, they conducted a far more thorough, far more comprehensive, and far more convincing analysis than what I'm showing you now, and they come up with exactly the same number, doubling of the risk of, of drought years in California. They didn't use the percentage to use these statistical relationships. Um, okay, so how do we how do we know what the cause of this is? Um, I, you know, whether or not, it, uh, maybe in this room it doesn't take too much convincing, but it's very clear, uh, in this case, we're looking at, um, at climate model simulations that have uh, the full forcing, the human and natural forcing, uh, comparing those same climate models with, with simulations where they only have the natural forcing, and we have a very, very high statistical confidence that the warming of California 
would not have happened without human emissions, and consequently, the increase in uh, the probability that low precipitation years are also warm uh, would similarly not have happened without uh, human contribution. Uh, if we look out in the future, um, can ignore the top, which is the uh, chronicle version of this. Um, on the bottom, what you see is uh, we're analyzing, in this case, one climate model, but with 30 realizations of the single climate model. So this is capturing internal variability. There's no climate model uncertainty in this particular analysis because it's only one model. All the different, uh, all the variability is due to uh, internal climate system variability. What we see in those simulations uh, is a statistically significant increase in uh, in the future uh, of uh, one, the uh, percentage of years, the risk of years that have extremely low precipitation, that's statistically significant, uh, in terms of 12-month period. Then we also see a statistically significant increase in the percentage of autumn and spring seasons that have extremely low precipitation. That's within the context of uh, essentially no change in the annual mean precipitation in California. So the point I want to make with that is that um, the mean isn't going to tell us about the extremes. It might, but it, but it won't necessarily. If we want to understand extremes, we have to understand uh, the processes that, that make extremes and the statistics of extremes. In addition, what we see is that there's you know, such clear warming in California going forward in the future with, with continued greenhouse gas concentrations that right out about the two-degree level, um, you know, about 2040, 2050 in this scenario, uh, every year, 100% of the years are extremely warm, and as a result, 100% of the low precipitation years are also extremely warm. So what you read in the paper is something like a essentially 100% risk that, that when low precipitation happens, it's happening in this extremely warm environment. Uh, so that's, again, right at that policy target. Uh, so I, I should be closing up. Um, so I want to say, I mean, we've heard a lot about snow already. I don't think I need to um, go into this too much other than to say that when we look at this uncertainty in um, there's been some consternation about precipitation uncertainty and what that means for drought, what that means for snow. And just like with the drought measures, temperature really overwhelms uh, precipitation uncertainty for snow. And in this case, we're, we're running multiple high-resolution simulations, and there's a bunch of panels on here. All I want to show you is that if you look at the third panel from the left, but really, the, the only column that has blue in it, that's precipitation. And these are five realizations of a high-resolution climate model. Um, it's, this is all internal variability. There's no, um, there's no model difference. And what you see is a real scattershot of increasing and decreasing precipitation trends. But the temperature, even over, again, that two-degree uh, level of warming, temperature overwhelms uh, the precipitation uncertainty to create real clear um, real clear signal of, of decreasing uh, snowpack and, and earlier snowmelt. And the last thing I want to say in closing is that this is not new. And uh, um, uh, Andy Redkin uh, posted earlier this year when, when the governor made his announcement on April 1st, uh, Andy Redkin posted this, um, this uh, drawing from a Discover Magazine article in 1988 uh, that uh, lays out uh, Peter's uh, projection of the future, which is exactly what we're seeing, you know, in, in the uh, intervening 25 or 30 years, it's exactly what, what's being projected for the future, and the only real difference is that it's happening sooner than 2050. Um, and uh, I guess that's, I, I want to close with that, because this, this is not, you know, as, as we're progressing uh, you know, year after year with, with studying climate change and climate impact, we're learning new nuances, but really the the basic understanding is really consistent, and if anything, we're just getting confirmation of what was already hypothesized, and if anything, that it's happening sooner than what was previously predicted. So thank you.